Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2021. <laughs> this is a five month mission I'm on with a bunch of BookTubers where we talk about Star Trek fiction for the rest of the year. Uh, August we devoted to Star Trek the original series, and August is waning. Doesn't feel that way. It's gone back to being 95 degrees here in Boston, but with choking 70 or 80 percent humidity, so it doesn't feel like it's the end of August. It doesn't feel like we're entering September this week. Uh, but it is nevertheless true on the calendar, and once we get to September, we are moving on to Star Trek The Next Generation, the next iteration of Star Trek. So we're in the waning days of Star Trek, the original series, for now, and I thought uh, for today I would try something a little different. Recently, one of our co-hosts, Michael K. Vaughn, uh, talked about Gold Keys, uh, the publisher Gold Keys uh, Star Trek comic books. Uh, which are best experienced on an entire plate full of peyote. <laughs> they are weird, they are surreal, they are not particularly enjoyable, they're certainly not Star Trek, in the sense of where you, you look at a novel or even an episode of a TV show and you say, ah, that gets Star Trek. Gold Key is an entirely different experience. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I have all of those Gold Key comics uh, on electronic form. I don't know. Again with the slurping. Uh, I don't know that I would that I would keep room for them on my shelf. They're just, I mean, Michael's video is very, very affectionate, but the comics just aren't good. They aren't good as Star Trek, and they aren't good as anything else. Uh, but that isn't true of all Star Trek-related comics. So I thought I would go afield as well, just for one of these last videos, and talk about Star Trek comics, not the ongoing Star Trek comic, or any of the long series that I have followed, hoping to find a really good, even single issue. But instead, a run, a run, as we've talked about on comic-related videos on this channel, is when a writer and an artist are in a kind of weird sync. They don't have to like each other, but where they're in a kind of weird sync of creativity, where they're in, an, in, in lockstep, and where they create something special together. And one of the easiest ways to have a run like that between a writer and an artist is if they're the same person. <laughs> if the writer and artist are the same person, Often you can get a good run on a book. We see that in Frank Miller's Daredevil. We see that. Uh, there are a number of different examples. And one name that comes to mind when you're talking about a writer-artist creative run is John Byrne. Canadian-born, I believe, although that doesn't excuse everything. <laughs> he started out as uh, an artist, became a fan favorite at Marvel Comics, and took over writing duties of a lot of his own titles, and for a while, about ten years ago, he did Star Trek comics for IDW, for the comic publisher IDW. Uh, and he wasn't, of course, he, he's an 800-pound gorilla by this point, so he, no, no, no one at IDW told him what to do. They had the franchise for Star Trek comic books, but aside from obeying the rules that we talked about, the rule book that we talked about, which does apply to comic books, less so, a lot less tightly, but it still does. You can't kill anybody. Uh, aside from that, Byrne had a completely free hand to explore any aspect of Star Trek that he wanted to do. It turns out he's mostly interested in Star Trek, the original series, and that is what he got. He, he did a whole mini-series on the Romulans, the old continuity-sanctioned version of the Romulans that were weirdly Roman. They had Roman societal and military ranks. They had a vaguely, you know, decline and fall of the Roman Empire ethos and look and feel to it all. All taken basically from the episode Balance of Terror. Uh, where we not only learn that the Romulans are an offshoot of the Vulcan race, but also that they are militaristic and they have all of ancient Rome's social and military titles and ranks. Uh, it didn't make a whole lot of sense, you know, it, it, it later fandom, before the, the Romulans were slightly retconned to be very different than, than that, uh, later fandom said that was all just the Universal Translator, that, the, that Starfleet's translator was doing that, but that the Romulans didn't do that. And that was done in a lot of canonical Star Trek novels as well, but uh, the Romulans interested uh, John Byrne. It, it, Byrne is a hit-or-miss author. He's, he's a hit-or-miss artist as well. Sometimes when he's invested in a project, he will do a lot of the work. Other times, he will shamelessly phone things in. Just shamelessly. Where the panel breakdowns will be, will be lazy. 
uh, and journeyman like where he won't do backgrounds uh, famously the, the the apocryphal rumor is that he was fired from Marvel Comics for handing in a seven page fight scene that consisted of seven pages of blank panels with sound effects and he was once a uh, higher up at the company saw this I mean it went in it, it went all the way to the issue it was Alpha Flight and it was what happens if two white two characters in white costumes fight each other in a blizzard <laughs> you wouldn't be able to see them no that's not how you do it that's not how you the, the rumor has always been that although it went all the way to the issue I have that issue in a box here uh, once a higher up at Marvel Comics once an executive who doesn't care about the line items of the comics themselves certainly doesn't follow Alpha Flight or care about the continuity or isn't going to read the thing once someone brought that to their attention that one of your artists turned in seven blank pages they fired him I don't know if that story is true but it matches with a lot of the stuff that I've heard about John Byrne over the decades that he can if he's invested in a project you can really tell I don't quite know uh, a, if that's true, and B, if you can tell in the project that I'm talking about today, a lot of it will depend on how energetic his inker is. And there, are, there are far more uh, legendary Marvel artists than John Byrne who did mainly just rough breakdowns, and the inkers did all the rest. Uh, but he continued on. He did a couple of stories starring a character we just talked about recently here, Gary Seven from Assignment Earth, uh, a, a genetically engineered human who is sent back uh, he, he, his ancestors were taken from Earth they were bred in a, a captive population on an alien planet and he was sent back to Earth as a clandestine agent to save Earth from its own worst excesses uh, in Assignment Earth which was basically a tryout for a pilot for a separate series in which we would follow his adventures that pilot, that series never happened uh, but Gary Seven has become a beloved character in, in Star Trek people love all the possibilities that, that his storyline opens up uh, and a whole bunch of other things. A whole bunch of other uh, uh, items that attracted John Byrne. And he did issue after issue for IDW in full color. And they were fairly fairly good. He did uh, the thing that I didn't notice at first. I, didn't, I confess, I didn't notice. I wasn't paying all that much attention to uh, non-superhero comic book companies. I didn't notice until he did a four-part series uh, for IDW starring the adventures of Dr. McCoy after the five-year mission. But before Star Trek The Motion Picture. Star Trek The Motion Picture fought, takes McCoy out of retirement. He's a bearded hermit. He ha seems like he hasn't been practicing medicine. He certainly hasn't been on board an Enterprise. Uh, Byrne imagines adventures that he was having in various situations on various planets for that four-issue run. And uh, that was when I first started noticing Byrne's IDW Star Trek run. And I kind of sort of liked it. I wasn't quite sure about some of the decisions in that McCoy run, the characterization of Jim Kirk as a happy bureaucrat, who's perfectly happy being chief of operations for Starfleet, that didn't really yearn to go back to, to on board a vessel or out into the unknown. That that seemed to me to jive to to fit poorly with the characterization that we see in the movie that the the series is leading up to. And also, uh, for some weird reason, I won't stress this too much, because artists have their own prerogative, but for some weird reason in those four issues, Byrne decided to draw uh, Bones McCoy as Oriental in his face. I, I, I don't understand that. I, I, John Byrne, I mean, DeForest Kelly has a, a, a pouchy, older-looking face, but Byrne knows how to draw faces of all kinds. <laughs> and for some reason, he decided not to do that in those four issues. It's kind of very strange. But very enjoyable. Those issues were very enjoyable, and I thought nothing more of it. Uh, until a few years ago, IDW came out. They put all that burn stuff together in a collection, in an omnibus edition. What BookTube insists on calling a bind-up. Like we were all carrying our, you know, Brady Bunch uh, lunch boxes, and we're going to the Scholastic Book Fair together in our short pants. There's no such thing as a bind-up, <laughs> okay? There's no such thing as a bind-up. Collection, omnibus, anthology, whatever word you want to use, whatever word you want to use, the English language has had for 300 years. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, they decided to put all those those issues together, and I don't know that I... Originally, I would have thought that all those issues were so good that I would care, but the the anthology that they put together is beautiful. It's this thing. I don't know if you're going to be able to make it out here on this camera, but the, these those starships are embossed. And they are arching towards the stars in the shape of the Federation symbol. And this is uh, just a beautiful thing. The Burn Collection. 
uh, you see that is not the NC NCC 1701. That is NCC 1717. There are other Federation Constitution class starships that, that star in this book. Another one of the Federation starships that stars in this book is the Enterprise, only under Captain Pike. Number one, Captain Pike's inscrutable and extremely competent first officer is all through this book. We see her as number one. We see her later as a Commodore, then as an Admiral. We see her slowly graying, her hair slowly graying. We see her change from the uniforms of Captain Pike's era, which were heavy-duty uh, corn-colored jerseys, to the, the uh, pajamas of Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, she runs throughout this book, but this is not one whole story. It's a big thing. Uh, you get a couple of adventures of Gary Seven and Roberta Lincoln. You get a few adventures set in the Romulan Empire, scheming with the, with the Klingons and whatnot. A little bit of backstory behind the, uh, the alliance between the Romulans and the Klingons that was done purely for cost-cutting measures in the original series. The, the, uh, the showrunners wanted to have uh, a Romulan episode, but they either couldn't find or didn't feel like refilming the Romulan bird of prey that they'd already used in Balance of Terror, so they had the Romulans using Klingon vessels, and that had to be explained. That, that the Klingons were leasing the Romulans some of their vessels, or that it was a, a kind of a parts-sharing deal or whatever, that should have been the rest of the whole of the original series. If the Klingon Empire and the Romulan Star Emperor, uh, Empire combined their forces, there would have been war on the Federation that the Federation would have lost. That would have been a huge story. Instead, it had to be passed over as a footnote uh, and sort of folded into the Organian Peace Treaty. Burn is free to explore it all he wants. It's not canonical, so he gets to explore it all he wants. He gets to show you adventures of Gary Seven because they're not canonical. Uh, he gets to show you adventures of Captain Pike's crew because they're not canonical. Uh, Jim Kirk is in here every once in a while. McCoy's adventures in between the series and the first movie are non-canonical. They're open to, to, to burn speculation. And it, I've been rereading it for, uh, for Book Trek 2021, and I have really enjoyed it. I have enjoyed it a lot more than I enjoyed it the first time I read through this hardcover. Uh, but the highlight, for me, the best part of this is a single issue, and it is canonical. Where uh, Byrne tells the story of Balance of Terror. This is a original series episode that I have mentioned a few times. It's, it just never dulls in how good it is where an, a Federation outpost is attacked by a Romulan vessel that not only has an invisibility cloak, but it has an experimental plasma field weapon that's utterly devastating. And Kirk and crew arrive at the station too late to save it, but not too late to know that there's a Romulan vessel under cloak in the area, perhaps trying to get back to the neutral zone, pr trying to get back to the Romulan Empire, having bloodied the nose of the Federation after a long, many years of peace. Kirk has to chase the vessel. He can't run the risk of this of of this being an incitement to war. Instead, he has to run the risk of inciting a war himself. And the captain of that Romulan vessel, played by Mark Leonard, the man who would later go on to play Spock's father, and also later go on to play the Klingon commander in the first open in the opening scene of Star Trek: The Motion Picture, thereby becoming the only actor to play a Vulcan, <laughs> a Romulan, and a Klingon in the series. Uh, the Romulan commander in that episode. Once again, unnamed. We have a whole bunch of Romulan commanders with hardly any names until we get to the next generation. But that Romulan commander turns out to be a strange figure. A complex, three-dimensional figure. A capable commander, although, like everyone else, he is out-commanded by Jim Kirk. Who, as Diane Carey puts it in one of her novels, has the uncanny ability to read the mind of his opponents. He gets in sync with them, and suddenly there's nothing they can do that he won't anticipate. You'll, the only chance you're going to have to take him out is by surprising him right at the beginning. Because after that, no more of your surprises are going to work on Jim Kirk. Uh, we get a sense that the two commanders are very like each other, and that sense is confirmed at the very end. This, this Romulan commander has amazing moments. He wants to hide his ship's trail in the, in the trail of a comet, for instance. But before he does that, he marvels at it, this, this wonder in the dark. And at the end, when all is lost, and he has no option left but to, to, to perform one final duty, before he does that, when he's finally talking face-to-face -face with Jim Kirk, he says, in a different reality, I could have called you friend. Where do we ever see stock cardboard television science fiction villains just idly musing about different realities? It was amazing. It was just amazingly done. 
Uh, and in, there's one issue in the Romulan run of Burns' storytelling on Star Trek for IDW in which he tells that story. The, the issue is hugely full. We don't get anything on the Enterprise. It's from the Romulan point of view, and we, it makes you realize when you're reading that issue how much time we spend on that Romulan vessel in that episode. He barely has to add, add any dialogue to convey the whole of the story. And it's just as powerful when he does it on the page as it is on the screen. So I, that was the highlight of my rereading of this thing, but I was happy to reread the whole thing uh, for Book Trek. Let me show you some, there we go. some lovely, lovely artwork. He, he does uh, space stuff, but he also does uh, a topside transporter effects, crews, alien monsters, just, just, just terrific stuff. Just, just terrific stuff. And the adventures of, uh, of Bones McCoy. Uh, so, a little bit of a departure, not a Star Trek novel, uh, but still, something I was very happy to revisit. I figured if Michael K. Vaughn can look at comics, so can I. I used to have an entire box of, uh, of Star Trek comics that I think it was Marvel that had the franchise. Michael might know better than I do. Mar I think Marvel had the franchise forever and ever and ever. And they did. They were, they were, most of the issues were utterly forgettable, but there were a few that weren't. There were a few that were very good. I seem to remember one in particular, Trial of James Kirk, uh, that I wish I had. I wish I had that individual issue they, where they, they bring back every single character who has any contact with Kirk from the original show. Uh, including Leonard James Akar, <laughs> the child uh, on uh, of uh, from Capella, who's a grown man in the in that issue. I don't have any of those. I don't know if they're collected. I don't know that I'd want them. Uh, but I'm glad to have this one, absolutely. And I may, I think uh, I forget who does Star Trek now. Is it still IDW or is it Dark Horse? Uh, anyway, there's a series that they're doing, Star Trek Year 5, that's, uh, every issue that I've read of it has been very, very good. If there were ever a big omnibus of that, I might get that as well. Uh, but there you go, that's your book track for today, and tomorrow, tomorrow is our last book track 2021 for the original Star Trek. My stomping ground, my Star Trek, the one that meant everything to me, the one that I know backwards and forwards. Then we move on, not just to another Star Trek franchise, there are quite a few Star Trek franchises that I love. Star Trek Enterprise has the captain of the Enterprise who has a dog on board the vessel and the dog is a beagle. <laughs> uh, Star Trek Voyager, I absolutely love. Uh, huge trunks of, of Deep Space Nine that I love, but Star Trek The Next Generation? No. No. I'm looking to fix that. And we're going to see if that can happen. Uh, I don't know if it can happen through the books, but uh, one of you very generously sent me the whole of the run of the show on on e-file and I'm pretty sure it's on uh, either Netflix or Amazon Prime anyway and I subscribe to both of those so I will be doing a lot of next generation rewatching, a lot of it to see what I can see to see what new conclusions I come to but first tomorrow we have our last Star Trek original series video together uh, so we're wrapping up this first month of Book Trek 2021 uh, Vin is our leader, Vin at Revenant Reads. He and Michael K. Vaughn and I did recently a conversation on his channel about all things Star Trek. That was so much fun. My connection was a little dodgy, but it, it improved as the, as the hour goes on. I'll leave a link to it down below in case you haven't seen my, uh, my arrows pointing to it before. You should especially go to see it now that it has a new thumbnail. <laughs> uh, there may be... <laughs> I, can't, I can't vouch for this. Uh, but there may be a barrage of customized Star Trek thumbnails headed your way. And if there, if it happens, I think you're going to like it. You're going to find it a little weird, but I think you're going to like it. And that has been my experience with Star Trek, the original series fans. They're a little weird, but I like them. <laughs> so we shall see. Anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.